Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Advocacy, Lobbying, Know the Difference webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, July 11, 2012. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Joanne Bouchard. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hi. Good afternoon. This is Joan Bouchard. I'm Senior Program Officer at the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky, and thank you to all of you for joining the call. Today we're offering the third webinar in the 2012 Health for a Change training series. This is Advocacy, Lobbying, Know the Difference. The free series combines webinars and in-person workshops designed to support the work of coalitions doing the important work of fostering health change in Kentucky. First, I'd like to begin with just a little bit of information about the foundation. The Foundation for Healthy Kentucky was founded in 2001 with a mission, quote, to address the unmet health care needs of Kentuckians. This is done by making grants and supporting research, as well as convening stakeholders and providing training and technical assistance through events like this one. Uh, we also provide policymakers with resources and information to, that they need to make the decisions that impact the health of Kentuckians. These are the um, current initiatives of the foundation, it's promoting responsive health policy, and investing in Kentucky's future. Today we're joined by Nayantara Mehta, the Senior Counsel with Alliance for Justice. It's the leading, it's the leading expert on the legal framework for nonprofit advocacy efforts. And Nayantara is part of Alliance for Justice's Boulder Advocacy Initiative. This program strengthens the capacity of the public interest community to influence public policy. Nayantara will explore the differences today between lobbying and non-lobbying advocacy activities by nonprofit organizations. But before we um, begin this webinar, I want to remind you of the scope of the Health for a Change series. And I know you can't read this, this copy of the flyer, but you can find a readable copy of the training calendar on the website. Um, the foundation launched this series in May with two webinars um, that were demonstrated how you and your partners can find and use data sources to assess the health of your community. If you missed those two webinars, you can access them on the Foundation's website, www.healthy-ky.org. Just look underneath the Presentations and Reports tab. Um, we still have a limited number of spaces available for a July 25th workshop, How Change Happens, the Tour of Health Policy in Kentucky. This workshop will help you understand how local and state health policies are affected and effected in Kentucky. And the speakers will include Drs. Sheila Schuster, Ellen Hahn, and Marion McClure Taylor. You can register for any of the series remaining webinars and workshops by going to the Foundation's website. And with that said, let's start today's webinar. I'd like to welcome and thank Nayantara Mehta. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for inviting Alliance for Justice to present this information. For those of you who aren't familiar with Alliance for Justice and our Boulder Advocacy Initiative, um, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we have a California office. And the goal of our program is to get more nonprofits involved in advocacy in whatever form makes sense for the organization. And we think that there's there are so many misconceptions. We know there are so many misconceptions out there about what nonprofits are allowed to do, and it's not helped by the fact that there are some kind of confusing laws out there. So what we try to do is make the laws that apply to nonprofits as clear and understandable as possible. 
um, so that you are confident about your ability to influence policy. And while, yes, there are some restrictions for nonprofits, it's important to know that there's a lot you can do. Um, and we also work with foundations to encourage them to support advocacy by their grantees or, or even to engage in advocacy, advocacy themselves um, up, up until what's allowed under the law. Um, so I will be going over the agenda in just a moment, and I'm going to be speaking and presenting quite a bit of information for the next um, 40 minutes or so or um, 35 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll save some time for questions at the end. And I think um, you've seen um, in the instructions that you can type in questions in the chat box, and you can, if, you're, uh, if you've called in, you can speak your questions at the end. Um, but I just want to make sure you know that this presentation and the opportunity to ask questions right now is not your last chance to ask your questions. We have a number of written materials on our website. It's bolderadvocacy.org, and I'll come back to show you this web address at the end. Um, we have free technical assistance where you can call us or email us every day. We have somebody on call to take questions. And so I'm, I'm telling you this information up front because um, I'm, I'm Full disclosure, we're going to be giving you a lot of information. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. If there's something that wasn't clear today and you don't have a chance to ask the question today or something occurs to you after today, um, please feel free to call us or email us. Check out our website. Think of us as a resource for, um, for knowing what kinds of advocacy activities you can engage in because that's what we really want to do. We want to support the important work you're doing in Kentucky and, and all over the country. Um, so with that, um, this is what I uh, I just want to uh, go over a few basic points, and this is kind of kind of the agenda. Um, and these are some I think just good rules of thumb. Um, many of you on the call will receive government funding, state and federal funding, and the general rule for nonprofits that receive federal funds is that you can't lobby with those federal funds. Uh, lobbying is a specifically defined activity, not all forms of advocacy or lobbying. So it's important to know what the definition of lobbying is attached to your federal funds. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, in just a moment. Uh, but some of you may be familiar with the fact that the CDC has um, issued some guidance on um, how they're implementing anti-lobbying provisions and talking about how, what what does it exactly mean for nonprofits that receive federal funds? What does that mean for state and local government that receive federal funds? So there is guidance out there, um, but the general rule of thumb is that if you, you have federal funds, you can't lobby with it. If your funding comes from state sources that didn't ultimately originate with federal funds, then the rules are probably going to differ. And some state funding may allow you to lobby with it, and some state funding may not. So you need to know where your funds come from and what restrictions apply. There's unfortunately no one-size-fits-all rule or answer that I can give you that applies uniformly to every different single source of funding. Um, also, foundation funding, if you get f uh, funding from a private foundation or from a community foundation, there might be some different restrictions. So I uh, just want to get back to the fact that it's really important for you to read the language of your grant agreement or your award, your award letter that will lay out the terms of the grant, what you're allowed to use the funding for, and what you're not allowed to use the funding for. And you just need to make sure that you are complying with the terms of all of your grants because, of course, you have to report back to your funder about how you use the, the funding. And although you might have certain sources of funding that have restrictions attached to them, like you generally can't lobby with federal funds, but that doesn't mean you can't lobby. It means you have to find another source of funds available to lobby. So just because you have certain pots of money that say you cannot lobby with this money doesn't mean you can't lobby. It just means that you need to have some unrestricted funding available. And that for those of you that have limited unrestricted funding available, it might be um, a good impetus to try to secure some of those less restricted sources of money so that you can actually lobby with it. And then there's going to be some different rules that apply to state and local government, nonprofits, colleges and universities. So it's really important that you talk if you are um, with an agency that has a general counsel or whoever is the, the head compliance person for the organization, it's important that you ask your employer what the rules are for your organization. Um, and you, you may also be aware of the fact that there are the legal rules about what exactly you can do with certain sources of money. But some organizations and some agencies have their own internal policies. And they might limit 
who can say what on behalf of the organization. And that might not be a legal consideration so much as just an internal policy that only certain people are allowed to speak on behalf of the organization. So you just want to make sure that you're complying with your organization, with your employer's rules. And finally, for nonprofits, you need to make sure you follow the IRS rules and the definitions too. And I'm going to be spending the bulk of the time in this hour talking about the IRS rules for nonprofit organizations, and in particular for 501c3 organizations. And um, before going forward too much, I'll just say a little bit about 501c3 organizations. I've used the term nonprofit a few times already, and when I'm doing that, I'm generally being a little bit lazy and referring to 501c3 organizations. Uh, 501c3s are one type of nonprofit. They're the most common type of nonprofit organization. There are also 501c4 organizations that are also nonprofit. But most of the time when we use that term nonprofit, when we refer to nonprofits, they're usually going to be 501c3 organizations. And that means they're organized under Section 501c3 of the Federal Tax Code. And it just means that you have to comply with the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, and tax law rules for what 501c3s can and can't do. And my understanding is that most of you on the call right now or listening to the webinar right now are affiliated with nonprofit organizations. And I'm assuming that means most of you are affiliated with 501c3 organizations. And that's where I'm going to be focusing the bulk of um, my explanation today um, because the rules that apply to nonprofits are going to be a little bit different than the rules that apply to state and local government. Um, and like I said, if you do work for state and local government or nonprofit for that matter, talk to your employer and your um, your general counsel, your lawyer, your organization's lawyer to figure out what exactly is allowed for your organization. And I want to just illustrate the point that lobbying is a specifically defined activity. And this, you can see in front of you a slide that has a number of activities. Community organizing, educating legislators, doing research, educating the public, lobbying. So there's a lot of different ways to do advocacy. Lobbying is one way. I don't use the term lobbying and advocacy interchangeably. I think lobbying is one form of advocacy, but advocacy is much broader than lobbying. There's, there's lots of ways to do advocacy that don't involve lobbying at all. And so what you just need to do is, again, go back to your sources of funding and find out how did they define lobbying because the definitions of lobbying are going to be a little bit different depending on where your money is coming from. And I'm, I'm going to be spending a lot of time explaining the IRS definition of lobbying for 501c3s, um, but I will also just go over the fact that for recipients of federal funds, there are slightly different definitions of lobbying. And I'm going to just give you three basic principles today. The first one is that recipients of federal funds generally cannot seek reimbursement for certain activities. And meaning you can't use federal funds for those activities. For state and local governments that receive federal funds, there is a document called OMB Circular A1, uh, excuse me, A87. And OMB is the Office of Management and Budget. And so it's really easy to find this. You just do a search for OMB Circular A87. And this lays out what state and local governments that receive federal funds are and are not allowed to do with those federal funds. And I won't spend time on that right now, just directing you to the fact that this circular explains what is allowed to be spent with federal funds and what you should avoid using federal funds for if you're state and local government. For nonprofits that receive federal funds, there's a different circular. It's OMB circular a122, and this is also very easily found online. Just do a search for circular A122. And um, this will tell you that if you're a nonprofit receiving federal funds, you may not use federal funds to influence state or federal legislation, including direct and grassroots lobbying. And OMB circular A122 provides its definition of what it means by lobbying specifically. It includes knowing preparation for your lobbying activities. And so there, there would be more information available in the circular that would flesh out that idea of what is lobbying um, for the purposes of not being able to use federal funds um, to do that activity. And then another basic rule is that 
you cannot lobby with federal funds for more federal funds. So this isn't just lobbying to influence policies. This is lobbying for more federal funds. And again, I won't go into too much of the details on it. Just you'll, you'll have a copy of the slides after this presentation. And um, you can see there on the slide that uh, recipients of federal funds are not allowed to influence members of Congress or their staff in connection with a federal contract, grants, loans, cooperative agreements. Uh, and so it's just important to remember that there, there are limitations on what you can do with federal funds. And that's the trade-off for receiving federal funds. But just because there are these limitations on the use of federal funds does not mean you can't engage in these activities with other sources of funds. So getting back to that point that it's really important to have unrestricted sources of funding. Uh, it may be foundations give you unrestricted general support grants. That's the best kind of grant for nonprofits if we get unrestricted general support grants where we can spend it on the things we need to spend it for. So that's the best case scenario. Um, but there's other ways to have unrestricted sources of funds. Maybe you have membership dues or um, I uh, interest income. There, there, so there are different ways for you to raise unrestricted source, uh, sources of money. And with those unrestricted sources of money, you can focus or you can use the those sources of money on your lobbying activities. And this brings me to the third rule, which I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about, that for 501c3 nonprofit organizations, and 501c3 is, like I said before, just one type of nonprofit, but they're the most common type of nonprofit. For 501c3s, you can lobby. There's no question about it. It's right there in the tax code, 501c3s can lobby. However, a C3 cannot do a substantial amount of lobbying, so it can do a little bit of lobbying. And that, of course, raises the question of, well, how much is that exactly? How much lobbying can we do as a 501c3? And the answer to that is a little bit more complicated than I wish it was. The way that a 501c3 figures out how much lobbying it can do how much exactly is, is a substantial amount of lobbying, is going to depend on whether it measures its lobbying under either the insubstantial part test, which you see there on the top of the screen, or the 501H expenditure test. And we recommend that almost all 501C3s choose the second option, the 501H expenditure test. And the reason for that is because if you're under the insubstantial part test, all that the IRS tells us is that lobbying must be an insubstantial part of your organization's activities. Lobbying may not be a substantial part of your organization's activities. But it doesn't really tell you what is insubstantial. The IRS has never defined with a number what it means by insubstantial. What, is it, what does it mean to do an insubstantial amount of lobbying? They haven't told us. And they haven't really defined lobbying with a lot of clarity. And this is the default test for 501c3 organizations, which means that if you're a 501c3 and you haven't affirmatively chosen the 501h expenditure test, you're automatically under the insubstantial part test. And it doesn't mean you can't lobby. You can certainly lobby under the insubstantial part test. It just means that I couldn't give you a whole lot of clarity on figuring out how much you can lobby or what exactly is and isn't lobbying. Lobbying is generally efforts to influence legislation. But you can imagine that's kind of broad. Efforts to influence legislation, a lot could fall in that category. And in terms of the amount that 501c3s can spend under the insubstantial part test, I, I've mentioned that the IRS hasn't given us a number. However, a lot of people who advise 501c3s will say, keep your lobbying to 5% or less of your overall activities. So that is um, a rule of thumb that a lot of organizations go with. And um, however, if you go with that 5%, you should know that the IRS has never officially affirmed, yes, 5% is insubstantial. And the reason that the 501H expenditure test is a lot better than the insubstantial part test, the reason why I recommend that most C3s choose five, the 501H expenditure test is that you get clear limits. You get a formula for figuring out how much you can spend on lobbying. And it's up to 20% of your annual expenditures can be devoted to lobbying, which is a pretty decent amount of money. 
Um, that's for smaller organizations at 20%. If you have larger annual expenditures than $500,000 a year, if you spend, let's say, a million dollars a year on your, all your activities, your lobbying limit will be smaller than 20%. So there's a, a kind of graduated formula starting at 20% and it gets smaller and smaller. And you get a pretty clear definition of lobbying if you choose this 501H expenditure test. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that definition of lobbying. And I said a few times that I recommend, and we at Alliance for Justice really strongly encourage most 501c3s to choose the 501H expenditure test. I should say that if you're a church, if you're a 501c3 church, you are actually not eligible to choose the 501H expenditure test. You're automatically under the insubstantial part test, which means you can lobby. You can definitely lobby if you're a church. It just means that you have the more vague standard, that you can only do an insubstantial amount of lobbying. But for other 501c3s that are not churches, that are, that are what are referred to as public charities, you can choose the 501h expenditure test. It's really easy to do it. You just fill out this IRS form. It's called Form 5768. You send it into the IRS one time, and you don't have to worry about it again. And once you do that, you get these this clear formula for figuring out how much you can lobby, and you get clear definitions of lobbying. And I think maybe one of the, the best features, or equally good feature of the 501H expenditure test is that all the IRS cares about is how much did you spend on lobbying. So all they care about having you report at the end of the year on your 990 form is, here are the dollars we spent on lobbying. They just want to check that you've stayed within your lobbying limit. And so what that means is that you can have a big effect. You can get the word out to a lot of people. You can mobilize lots of volunteers or community members in, in your emails or in your other public communications. And even though you may have a really strong effect on the outcome of a, of a piece of legislation, all the IRS cares about is how much did you spend. And oftentimes it's only going to be some percentage of staff time, some staff costs went to your lobbying efforts. So if you can take advantage of low-cost lobbying activities, you can do a lot of lobbying under the 501H expenditure test without racking up a lot of lobbying expenditures. And again, all the IRS cares about is what were your lobbying expenditures. So it's a really great way to maximize the amount of lobbying you can do while still staying within your annual lobbying limit. So again, just to reiterate, 501H expenditure test is the much better option for almost all 501c3s with the exception of churches which are not eligible to choose the 501H expenditure test. We have this publication on our website. You can see the image there called Worry-Free Lobbying for Nonprofits, and we have a whole lot of other fact sheets on um, lobbying definitions, benefits of the 501H expenditure test. So if you have more questions about this, I encourage you to check out our website. Um, the publication, the image you see, Worry-Free Lobbying, dispel some of the concerns people have about the 501H uh, ex expenditure test because there's, there's also some misconceptions about it. And so take a look at our website, see what resources we have. But also if you have questions about it, feel free to call us for te free technical assistance. Um, we've had people call us before where they, after listening to an Alliance for Justice presentation, think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for us, but I need to convince the board or I need to convince my chief financial officer to, to agree to this. And so then we've set up calls with the chief financial officer to, to talk through whatever their concerns are. So we're happy to do that because we really think that C3s can do a lot more lobbying under the 501H expenditure test, and by not choosing it, they're just limiting themselves to a more vague, uncertain standard when they have a much better option. Okay, so now I'm going to spend the, the next 10 minutes or so talking about the lobbying definitions. What does it actually mean to lobby? And these definitions apply to 501c3 organizations. Um, I've said a few times now that there are different lobbying definitions out there, and that's just unfortunate. I wish there was one definition of lobbying so that you know always this is what's lobbying and this is not lobbying. But unfortunately, there are different definitions out there. So what I'm telling you right now is the lobbying definition that applies to 501c3 organizations. And you need to keep your lobbying within your annual lobbying limits. And the activities I'm about to talk about are the activities that count as lobbying, that count toward that lobbying limit. And I, I said before when I was talking about the insubstantial part test that there is not a very clear definition of lobbying. And so I'm, I'm going to be spending time talking about the 501H expenditure test 
definition of lobbying um, because the, test, the definition of lobbying under the insubstantial part test is a little bit vague and uncertain. Um, for those of you who are going to remain under the insubstantial part test, whether by choice or um, because you have to if you're a church, I can direct you to, if you want to know more about the lobbying definition under the insubstantial part test, I would direct you to looking at the Form 990, which is the form that most 501c3s submit, and it's Schedule C. So it's the Form 990 Schedule C. And it's easy to find this online too. You just do a search for Form 990 Schedule C. And that's just schedules just like a section of the 990 form. And that's the section where 501c3s report their lobbying activities. And on that form, Schedule C, you'll see the types of activities that the IRS considers to be lobbying for 501c3s that are using the insubstantial part test. And it's part 2B of section, of, excuse me, of Schedule C. Um, so Form 990, Schedule C, Part 2B, <laughs> if that's not too many letters and numbers. And that will give you a good sense of what the IRS considers to be lobbying under the insubstantial part test. Um, but because there's a lot of uncertainty, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about what there is more certainty about, which is the lobbying definition under the 501H expenditure test. And I'm hoping that after today, those of you who don't use the 501H expenditure test will consider it because, um, like I said, the, you have a lot more clarity about how much you can lobby and what exactly is and isn't lobbying. So now, <laughs> that was all by way of introduction to what I'm moving into, which is defining how the IRS uh, what the IRS considers to be lobbying under the 501H expenditure test. And the IRS divides up lobbying into direct and grassroots lobbying. And direct lobbying is when you're talking directly to the legislators, and grassroots lobbying is when you're talking to the public and you're encouraging them to talk to their legislators. And I'm going to define them in much greater detail going forward. That's just to give you a general sense, direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. And the really good thing about these definitions the 501H expenditure test definitions. The good thing about the definitions is that you have to have all the pieces of the definition there in order for something to count as lobbying. So you have to have a communication with the legislator that expresses a view about specific legislation for something to count as direct lobbying. And for grassroots lobbying, you have to have a communication with the public that expresses a view about specific legislation and includes a call to action. If you're missing the call to action, it's not going to be lobbying. So it's really easy actually to walk through an example of a communication and figure out whether it's lobbying or not. And I'm going to start out by giving you an example of a communication. And this is, this is the easiest part. You know what a communication is. It's phone calls, emails, letters, um, in-person visits. Any way you convey a message is a communication. Here's another form of communication that may not immediately occur to you as a form of communication. Um, I like to use this example because it, it's creative and it's memorable. Um, this is a lobbying campaign from a number of years ago by the AARP where they sent a cake to each member of Congress, and each cake had a missing slice. And the message was, there is a missing prescription drug plan in the Medicare bill. So their message, they were communicating with cake, with the missing slice and the message that went along with it. They're communicating with legislators because each, each member of Congress got a cake. So they're communicating with legislators and expressing a view about specific legislation. They're saying, in that legislation you're considering, there is something really important missing and here's what we think about it. So this is a straightforward example of direct lobbying. And under the 501H expenditure test, all you have to do is count what it costs you to carry out this lobbying campaign. So if you had an army of volunteer bakers and people who were willing to, just, to deliver these cakes and you didn't pay them anything, then your lobbying costs will be very low. And if you can get a story, this is actually an image from the Washington Post, if you can get a story in the paper and only spend a little bit of money, a little bit of staff time on this, um, on this lobbying event, then that's great. You've had a great effect for not very much money. The definition of who is a legislator under the, the direct lobbying definition is going to include federal, state, and local legislators, as well as their staff, because you'll often be talking to their staff. And occasionally, 
somebody else will count as a legislator who you wouldn't always think of as a legislator. Uh, President Obama, for example, occasionally acts in a legislative capacity. Usually he's not. Usually he's um, exercising his, his executive uh, role in government. Um, he's the head of the executive branch. But sometimes he acts as a legislator when he participates in the formulation of legislation. And that could be when he's signing or vetoing legislation. So if you sent a message uh, to him saying, please sign, please veto legislation, you're engaging in direct lobbying because you're communicating with him as a legislator. Or if he is heavily involved in the content of legislation and you're communicating with him about that, then you're also communicating with him as a legislator. Same thing with somebody like the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. She's usually not a legislator. She's in the executive branch of government. She's the head of an agency. But occasionally, when she's participating in the legislative process, participating in the formulation of legislation, we can imagine the Affordable Care Act. A lot of groups were communicating with her about what should go in there. And so when you're communicating with somebody like the president or a high-level executive official, other government officials who, who can actually influence legislation, we would count that as lobbying too because we're talking directly to legislators about specific legislation. Who does not count as a legislator are members of what the IRS calls special purpose bodies. And the IRS has specifically called out the bodies that you see in front of you, school boards, zoning boards, housing authorities, as being non-legislative bodies. So when you communicate with them, if you're working at the local level, it's not going to be lobbying when you're talking to these bodies. But if you're talking to the city council, for example, about a city ordinance, that would be lobbying because you're talking to the city's legislative body. And before I move on from the definition of what is who is a legislator, I want to make sure to clarify that 501c3s can support and oppose ballot measures. And when you are talking to the public about ballot measures, the IRS actually considers you to be talking directly to the legislators. Because if you think about it, if you're voting on whether a measure should pass or not, when a measure's on the ballot and you're saying yes or no, it should be enacted, essentially, you are acting in a legislative capacity. So when a C3 communicates to the public about ballot measures, urging people to vote yes or no, or taking a position on ballot measures, then it counts toward the C3's direct lobbying. And so Two points I want to make here. When you work on ballot measures, it counts as direct lobbying. And to reiterate, the 501c3s definitely can support and oppose ballot measures. There are sometimes um, questions about, around that because they're, they seem like election activities. But the IRS treats ballot measures as legislation. So it treats it, your efforts to support and oppose ballot measures as lobbying. And it just counts toward your lobbying limit. Okay, what is specific legislation. We've covered direct lobbying occurs when you have a communication with the legislator about specific legislation. And what counts as specific legislation are those pieces of legislation that the legislature is considering. And you, it's pretty obvious when something is being considered by the legislature. Uh, it also will include budgets. So if you try to influence um, if, if the governor in your state plays an active role in shaping the budget, either the governor or the legislature on the budget, then that counts as communicating with the legislator about specific legislation. Um, budgets and taxes count when the legislature is voting. But the IRS considers specific legislation to go beyond just something that's been introduced. It also includes proposed legislation. So you see in front of you this guy and he's got a light bulb over his head. So if you're like him and you've got this great idea, you've got a light bulb going off over your head, you've got a great idea for proposed legislation, and you go talk to a legislator about that, even though nothing's been introduced or written up yet, if you're specific enough about what you want to see in that legislation, we would count that as lobbying too, because it's expressing a view about proposed legislation in enough detail that the legislator is pretty clear what you want them to do. So it's not just like we need more funding for, uh, that, that supports children in our state. 
it's more specific. Like we need funding for this kind of program or we need to increase funding for this program by X percent or we have a pr proposal to increase uh, to impose a, a tax on this commodity to increase funding for this program. So it's getting into specifics about what you want to see. What is not lobbying is your efforts to influence non-legislative actions. And that will include your work on regulations, executive orders, asking for a law that's already, that already exists to be enforced, or engaging in litigation. And this is really important around in, in for groups that work on health issues because, of course, um, at the at the federal level, for example, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot that's going to be going on within the Department of Health and Human Services. So your work on regulations is not going to count as lobbying, and the same goes at the state level. Uh, at litigation, if any, anyone took a position on the Affordable Care Act, that was recently um, the decision that was recently issued by the Supreme Court that upheld the Affordable Care Act and the individual mandate, if anyone took a position on that, like maybe you submitted a friend of the court brief or, or took a position on it, it's not lobbying because the court process is not lobbying. So there are plenty of ways to influence policy that don't count toward your lobbying limit at all because you're not influencing legislation. Okay, I just want to close out by talking about grassroots lobbying and talking about how it differs from direct lobbying. We've talked about communication. Here, in order for something to count as gra uh, grassroots lobbying, excuse me, you have to be communicating with the general public, expressing a view about specific legislation, and you have to have a call to action. And a call to action is the really important point here. For your communication to the public to count as grassroots lobbying, you have to have one of four very specifically defined calls to action. The IRS defines a call to action very specifically. You have to either be telling people to contact their legislators, providing the contact information for legislators, providing a mechanism to communicate with legislators, or identifying legislators who are going to be voting. And I'll give you some examples now. Here is a communication that says, Action Alert, the DREAM Act, call Congress to pass the DREAM Act and tune in for the vote. And then it's got some content, and then it says, please call your respective senators and House members now, and it provides the phone numbers. So this is a really straightforward example of grassroots lobbying. It has a communication to the public expressing a view about specific legislation, and it has a call to action. It says, call Congress, and it says, here's our contact information. So it has two different types of calls to action. So this is straightforward grassroots lobbying. It probably did not cost MALDEF very much to put this communication out. Here's an example of the third call to action where you have a communication to the public on specific legislation. I know it's grayed out so it's kind of hard to read, but it is about specific legislation, asking, people to, asking um, members of Congress to oppose some legislation. And it has a mechanism for people to communicate with their legislators. So you're sending this to people. You've already written up a, an email that you are proposing that the public send to their legislators. All they have to do is type in where they live, who they are, and then the program knows to send it to the re their relevant representative. So this is a straightforward example of grassroots lobbying where you're urging the public to communicate with their legislators by using a call to action on specific legislation. And then here's an example of the final call to action where you're not explicitly asking people to contact their legislators. You're actually just saying, here are the people who are going to be make, deciding this issue. So you're hoping people will see this and think, I should call those people. But you're not coming out and asking them to. And the reason I'm spending some time talking about how specific a call to action is, is that if you leave it off, it's not going to count as a lobbying communication. And again, this definition applies to 501c3s that have made the 501 that have chosen to measure their lobbying under the 501h expenditure test. So the benefit is when you're talking to the public, you can educate them, you can even express a view about specific legislation if you don't include a call to action where you essentially ask people to contact their legislators, it's not going to be lobbying. Here's an example. And I'm sorry, it might be a little bit hard to read because of the, um, the, most of the text being grayed out, but it says on the left there's two young girls smoking. It says, the more these cost, the less they'll smoke. Tell the legislature, raise the cigarette tax. And then it says, call the main legislature, and it gives House and Senate phone numbers 
protect our kids, not big tobacco. And if we had more time, I would ask you to look at this and consider whether it's lobbying or not. But since we're getting, um, we're getting close to a quarter to the hour, I'll just tell you that it's grassroots lobbying. It is a communication to the general public that expresses a view about specific legislation. It says raise a cigarette tax. That's before the legislature. And it has a call to action. It actually has a couple calls to action. It says tell the legislature. It says call the main legislature. So here is an example of grassroots lobbying, which is perfectly legal for 501c3s to do. You just want to make sure you're staying within your lobbying limit. If you receive federal funds, you wouldn't want to use federal funds on this communication, but you can use your unrestricted funds on this kind of communication. And it's lobbying. However, let's say you don't want to lobby. Let's say you're getting close to your lobbying limit and you want to avoid lobbying. Then you could put out this ad that says, the more these costs, the less they'll smoke. Raise a cigarette tax. Protect our kids, not big tobacco. And here, what I've done is take out the call to action. And often when I use this example, somebody will say, but it says raise a cigarette tax. That's a call to action. But I would say that the IRS has given us a very specific definition of what is a call to action, and raise is not a call to action. It doesn't say contact your legislator. It doesn't say here's how to contact your legislator. It doesn't say here's who's voting on this legislation. So it does not include a call to action. And therefore, this does not meet the IRS definition of grassroots lobbying. And so it wouldn't count toward a C3's lobbying limit if they're under the 501H expenditure test because it's missing the call to action. And then just a couple more examples. This one is from another campaign actually in Maine. It says, no paid sick days for restaurant employees. And it's got this place setting, an enhanced dining experience for restaurant customers. And the smaller text below says, nearly half of all workers in Maine lack paid sick days. Support your fellow Maine workers and their right to recover from illness without endangering public health or losing a day's pay. Contact your legislator and share your support of LD 1454, the Paid Sick Days Bill. And this communication, I would again just run through the definition of grassroots lobbying. So I'm thinking it's more likely to be grassroots lobbying than direct lobbying because this looks like a public communication to me. So that's, that's the first question. Is this more likely to be direct or grassroots lobbying? And I'm thinking probably grassroots. So we have a communication. I'm thinking to the general public, some kind of public ad. It expresses a view about specific legislation, explicitly mentions support for a named piece of legislation, and it has a call to action. It says, contact your legislator. So this is grassroots lobbying. The cost of this communication, whether you paid for it on a billboard, on a bus stop shelter, or sent it out by email, just the cost of the communication counts toward your lobbying limit. And here is another example from a similar message from this organization. It says, she'll be your server tonight, and she's pretty sure it's contagious. Nearly half of all workers in Maine lack paid sick days and are forced to work through their illnesses in order to pay the bills. Support LD 1454, the paid sick days bill. So this communication looks pretty similar, but I would again go through the definition. It's a communication, surely, to the general public expressing a view about specific legislation. And then the final question is, is there a call to action? And the answer is no. There's no call to action here because the IRS defines a call to action very narrowly. Support is not a call to action. It, it's maybe a call to action in the plain English sense of the term, or call to action, but in the IRS's definition of a call to action, support is not one. And so this communication is not a grassroots lobbying communication. It's not lobbying for a 501c3. And it doesn't count toward the C3's lobbying limit for the year. So again, just to illustrate the fact that there's a lot of ways to get information about even specifically identified legislation out there without engaging in lobbying. This again, falls under the IRS definitions. Um, what I'm talking about falls under the IRS definitions of what is lobbying and what is not lobbying. Remember that for federal funding purposes, there's going to be a slightly different definition of lobbying. So you want to refer back to your federal award to see how they define lobbying. 
if they use the IRS definition, then great. Then you, you can use these definitions I've been talking about. But if they use a different definition, then you need to explore that a little bit further and make sure that if you want to use federal funds for any communication, that you don't lobby according to their definition of lobbying. But um, coming back to the IRS definition of lobbying, definition of lobbying just want to close out with uh, lobbying exceptions. There are certain activities that the IRS has said, these are not lobbying activities. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on these. Um, we have uh, plenty of written resources that go into uh, quite a bit of detail on these um, exceptions. But the two that I think are particularly helpful are the first two. Uh, 501c3s don't have to count as lobbying. They're nonpartisan analysis, study, or research. And if they are invited, the second one, request for technical assistance, if they are invited to provide testimony to a governmental body. That first exception, nonpartisan analysis, study, or research, in order to qualify for this exception, in order to not have to count this study as lobbying, you have to include a full and fair discussion of the issue, meaning not just one side of it. You have to look at more than one side of the issue, and you have to broadly disseminate it. But then you're allowed to take a view on legislation, and it wouldn't count as lobbying. And so this is a great way to get your views out there on an issue to get the public and even legislators thinking about your issue. And then maybe later you'll lobby, but right now what you're trying to do is just educate people on the issue. And then the other exception that can be really useful for C3s is to be invited to testify before a legislative body. And in order to not have to count that as lobbying, you have to be invited in writing. You have to have a written invitation that comes from somebody who has the authority to invite you. So it will generally be the chair of the committee, somebody like that, somebody who has the authority to issue invitations on behalf of the committee. And you have to provide your information, whether in writing or in person, to all members of the committee. So this exception, this ability to not count this kind of testimony as lobbying, this only applies when you're providing your communication to the committee or the governmental body, not when you're talking about a one-on-one -on -one conversation like a legislator calls you up and says, hey, what do you think about this? If you're a 501c3 and you have unrestricted funds to, to allocate this conversation to and, and your activities, it's perfectly fine for you to respond to that one-on-one -on -one call and say, here's what we think on this legislation. But then you're probably lobbying, using the IRS definition of lobbying. If you don't want to have to count it as lobbying, you can request a letter in writing to provide your testimony to a body. So it just depends on whether you need to count some if, if you need to avoid counting something as lobbying, if you have enough room in your lobbying budget and you have enough unrestricted funds, there's no harm in just lobbying and not getting the letter in writing because you don't have to worry about your lobbying limit if you're not if you're not doing too much lobbying. In front of you is a chart, and it's actually two pages of chart that I'm not going to go into because it's kind of complicated. What I want to do is just allow you to have this chart in your handout so that you can refer back to the different federal laws that apply to grantees of generally federal funds. Um, so you have this to refer to to figure out where to look for more information. Um, but I would. I'm going to come back to our contact information, Alliance for Justice, Justice's contact information, um, because I want to make sure that if what I presented to you um, was maybe a little bit confusing or you need to let it sink in a little bit and you want to follow up with us, please do feel free to contact us for free technical assistance. Um, either call us or email us. There's an the address, email address advocacy at afj.org and our toll-free number there. Also, I mentioned our web, uh, website, boulderadvocacy.org, has a ton of fact sheets and publications that are free. Um, and if, you, um, if anyone's on Twitter, you can um, send us a message. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments about the presentation, we welcome um, more conversation about this. Um, so I know that Joan is going to um, facil facilitate the Q&A right now, but I, I do just want to um, acknowledge that what I have presented to you is a lot of information and it's a lot of details. And we are especially equipped to help you navigate the 501c3 lobbying definitions, like the IRS lobbying definitions. We don't have expertise on all the federal lobbying definitions because there's, there's, um, each, each agency might have slightly different rules. 
So we want to be helpful to you, but I also want to be upfront that we wouldn't always necessarily be able to provide you with a precise answer when it comes to your federal funds question. Um, we'll probably direct you back to your own in-house general counsel or to the agency itself. Um, but we're happy to receive your questions and, and see if we can help you in any way. Great. Thank you so much, Nayantara. Um, Carlos, do you want to open the line for questions? Sure thing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-turn prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1, followed by the 3. One moment, please, for the first question. Um, I have two here that came in on the chat. Um, Nayantara, the first one says, can a nonprofit classified as a church opt for the 501H expenditure test? The answer to that one is no, unfortunately. Back when I was talking about the insubstantial part test versus the 501H expenditure test, um, I mentioned that almost all 501C3s will benefit from the 501H expenditure test, but unfortunately churches are not eligible to choose the 501H expenditure test. So they, they lobby under the insubstantial part test. Okay, and, and then I have a second. Um, can employees of a public university lobby as long as they don't claim to represent the views of that institution? Um, this is going to get probably into um, the question of what can you do as an employee of a, of a public university. This is probably going to get more into university policy because technically universities are, they're generally going to be 501c3. So um, 501c3s can lobby according to the rules that I've talked about. However, you have to look at what are your different funding sources. And on top of that, like if, you're, if your position is funded by a particular funding stream and there's lobbying restrictions, then you can't lobby, of course, um, during the workday or on behalf of the university. Um, I don't see why you couldn't, on your, on your own time, um, lobby a, on issues that you care about as an individual. But I would urge you to check with your boss at you, your university because while I'm saying I don't see any legal reason why an individual couldn't lobby on their own time. Um, there may be some organizational policy that limits what people can do and say in their individual capacity. I, I'd be surprised if there was, but it's probably better to ask beforehand. Um, Carlos, do you have any questions there on the line? Not at the moment. Once again, to queue up for a question, you may press 1-4 on your telephone keypad. Okay, so I have one that says if a youth or intern um, representing an organization that's part of a state university addresses specific legislation with a legislator, is that lobbying? And, and I think that there's maybe the, a follow-up question to that is can a representative of a public university lobby at all? I think that's maybe connected. and. Um, the answer, I would actually go back to what I said before, which is that theoretically uh, an employee of a public university as a 501c3 can lobby according to the 501c3 rules, but universities will probably have specific internal policies about who is allowed to lobby on behalf of the university, which will be different than you who happen to work or volunteer for university lobbying on your own. Um, so that I will bounce it back to your employer and check check with your um, with your department head to find out what the restrictions are, if any. Okay, and then the next one says, under the Hatch Act, and then in parentheses, CSBG fund, can we educate clients about where to vote? Um, the county clerk happens to be in the same building where we provide client services. Uh, this is going to be another one of those <laughs> check with your employer answers. And the reason for that is because there are a couple of different funding sources where there are limitations on how whether a nonprofit employee can register people to vote. And it's fairly limited. Those restrictions are fairly limited. So um, usually the ability to register people to vote should not be affected by, um, by receiving federal funds, but there are a couple of limitations. And I'd actually suggest check out, there's a fact sheet by the organization Nonprofit Vote. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the clarification is you don't want to um, actually register people. Um, so 
check this is this is where I would get into the, the nuances of what activities you want to do are going to depend on and whether you're allowed to do those different activities are going to depend on what does the specific grant language say so um, there's this uh, I interrupted myself, I was saying before that there's this organization called Nonprofit Vote that has a couple of fact sheets specifically on nonprofits and what they're allowed to do around registering people to vote or educating people about the registration process. So just go to um, Nonprofit Vote and see about um, the, the fact sheets about nonprofits and helping people to, to vote because, again, like I said, there are some restrictions with some federal funding streams on registering people to vote, but it's it's fairly limited what those restrictions are. And sorry about the siren in the background. I'm right over the street. Um, and then another one says, how does an organization come under IRS scrutiny? Are there efforts to find lobbying excesses and who instigates such initiatives and why? Hmm. That that is a common question that we get uh, because you know we talk to 501c3s both about the lobbying limits and staying within your lobbying limits, but also about staying nonpartisan in an election year, meaning you can't support and oppose candidates for public office. And I didn't even touch on that today. Um, that's a whole other issue. Um, 501c3s can definitely get involved around elections, but they must do so in a nonpartisan way. And we inevitably get questions from organizations well, like, well, how does the IRS even find out about what we're doing? And I mean, the, I think the truth is that there's not enough people working at the IRS to monitor what every 501c3 is doing. Um, however, if what you're doing gets covered in the media or somebody at the IRS happens to see what you're doing or what we're seeing a lot of groups that don't like what you're doing submit a complaint to the IRS requesting that they investigate you, um, that's how potentially an IRS investigation could get started. Or it could be a random audit. So there's a number of ways. The percentage of C3s that get audited I think is tiny. So it's not that you have to worry about an IRS audit all the time. It's more I suggest thinking about your advocacy activities, your lobbying, and your election activities as if you may have to answer questions from the IRS. It's rare that you would have to. It's unlikely that you would have to, I should say. But I, I always suggest that organizations plan as if they would have to be audited by the IRS. How would they explain um, how they stay within their lobbying limits? How would they explain that they don't support and oppose candidates for public office? Um, so it, it's, it's rare. We don't think the IRS is going after groups for lobbying, for excessive lobbying. Um, and really your best protection is keeping good internal records of how much you're spending on lobbying, what you're doing. And we have a publication on our website called Keeping Track. You can just search for that on our bolderadvocacy.org website. Keep, uh, the publication is called Keeping Track. And it's all about how to implement a system to track your lobbying activities, to, to do timesheets if you want to do timesheets, so that you can appropriately figure out how much are we actually spending as a 501c3 on lobbying, and how do we make sure we're staying within our lobbying limits. So um, hopefully that, that semi-answers the question. <laughs> Um, Carlos, do you have any questions in queue? We have no questions in the queue at the moment, ma'am. Okay, everybody's decided to type theirs in. Um, I don't think there are any more um, questions, but I'd like to remind everybody that the slides and the audio from this webinar will be on the Foundation's website, www.healthy-ky.org, and they should be there in the next day or so. Thank you all for attending this webinar, and thank you to Nayantara. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.